All right, well, hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 313th New Social Environment. I'm Nick Bennett, the Special Projects Editor here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Nina Kachadorian and Thurza Nichols Goody. We're also thrilled to have the poet Fargo Nassim Tabaki here, who will read to close today's program. We start all of our events with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in Brooklyn, we are on the unceded land and waters of Lenape Hoking, which still belongs to the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second acknowledgement is that Black Lives Matter. We recognize the legacy of settle, settler colonialism as a part of the many contemporary expressions of white supremacy, and we honor those that have lost their lives to this violence. I encourage you all to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions as we all do our part in the learning and unlearning required to undo this legacy of injustice. And now to introduce today's host, writer, editor, artist, and interviewer, Thurza Nichols Goody was the senior art editor at the Brooklyn Rail from 2017 to 2019 and is currently an editor at large. You can read more about Thurza's brilliant writing and career in the bio linked in the chat, which will be shared shortly. But for now, Thurza, take it away. Thank you yet again. So thrilled to be here and especially thrilled to be here with um, wonderful Nina. We're gonna have a lot of fun today. Um, and so as, by way of introduction, I just wanted to mention that she has been called a national treasure and I absolutely <laughs> agree with this. I know, I know I felt like you're, you're gonna be embarrassed by that, but I, I, think, I think it's true. Um, just some facts that you might wanna know about aside from her being a, a, an inter, interdisciplinary artist, and we'll go into many of her projects, is that she was born in Stanford, uh, California, and has the uh, great, um, whatever, great position of being one of the 32 children who participated in the very famous marshmallow experiment, uh, which is um, an experiment to, um, uh, uh, analyze delayed gratification and its relationship to your your life now and you're still in it as you said so this yeah is I'm actually more like one of 500 people who are in it oh okay because yeah. and okay. you guys told me at the end of this I get a marshmallow right if I wait okay I hope that's true because oh my god I I you have way. time to go out and get a bag you guys um <laughs> anyway so there's many things that you'll learn about about Nina as we go um I think of her as not an imp of the perverse, um, as in Poe, but an imp of the marvelous. Um, and um, marvel and marvelous is something that comes up often when she's being spoken about. And I just wanted to remind people that that was what Breton was after, right? And I, I know the word, the, the S word surrealism can be seen as, uh, can sometimes seem sadly banal, but remember that it, his whole idea of the, of the marvelous was about convulsing reality. And definitely Nina convulses reality um, and also does it with great hilarity, which also reminds me of um, you know, something that, God, nobody really talked about when I was learning about our history with Duchamp. They made him seem so boring, right? Kind of, I'm sorry to say it, but very dry. He's hysterically funny. Right, um, um, and therefore I think that that we have to remember that hilarity has a very uh, complex and deep and serious roots. Um, so she's somebody who has has been said, you know, sees meaning everywhere. Um, I think she's a great role model for us. Um, she's a great, you know, I always tell my students that if you're an artist, you know, you you always have access to making wherever you are. Um, and you have things available to you. And in this time of the pandemic, um, everybody has been sort of, you know, locked in their own places and people learning to sort of grab from what's around us um, um, in terms of um, developing um, artistic practice. Well, this is just what Nina does. Um, she finds the secret correspondences. And I also think of her as if there was a way to describe it kind of that you're, you live in a different, you, Either you live or you have the vision of somebody who has access to all the dimensions. And it's like you have this sort of x-ray vision where you're, you're seeing all these connections. It's kind of like these threads that you have coming out of the eyes. Um, and we'll talk about this paranormal postcards in a minute. Um, but 
um, that, that, that you see in the world and you find, and again, it's always what's right in front of you. People have called it um, the mundane, the, the uh, um, finding the miraculous in the mundane. So I just wanted to mention that she had a, a, a retrospective um, in 2017, and we have a photograph of the catalog here. And it was a traveling exhibition, as you can see um, in the description. And the opening essay is written by Jeffrey Kasner, who I always like to give a shout out to fellow art writers when they write extraordinarily um, uh, important and wonderful essays. Um, and he just, he starts his essay, which is called Seriously um, Funny, talking about wonder, right? And wonder if, if, if is actually, people studied the sort of marvels and wonders that led to the enlightenment, right? So again, it's a very deep concept, has lots of other, other fun parts where it's, it's related to the word smile, so on and so forth. But <clears throat> um, a thousand years ago, I read um, Jonathan Crary's book on attention and modern culture. And we'll talk about her interest and use of attention many years ago. And here is one of the great quotes that has uh, led my life and, and I think is perfect for Nina's work, um, that it's, it comes from Descartes, from um, his discussion of admiration or wonderment in the passions of the soul. Um, and he describes it as kind of a different historical regime of attention, right? And we'll talk about attention, as I said. So here it is, here's his definition. Of wonder, in particular, we may say that it is useful and that it makes us learn and retain in our memory things of which we were previously ignorant, for we wonder only at what appears to us unusual and extraordinary. When something previously unknown to us comes before our intellect or our senses for the first time, this does not make us retain it in our mem memory memory unless in order to do so it is strengthened by some kind of passion. So the whole point of that is to say wonder is attached to intellection. And that's one of the things I want to get to um, in terms of, of, of Nina. Okay, I'm going to um, jump. That is a great quote. There's that. I love that. Isn't it? And, yeah. and you know, because we all love wonder, but it's always like, well, but it's not just about being awestruck. It's about mm -hmm. learning, right? And it's, and, and, Kasner also talked about the pedagogical with you. All right, and so in order to get into this discussion, um, I wanted to also highlight something he mentions in terms of her work being in a way often about rescue, recovery, um, and care. And pay that paying attention is a form of care, right? Uh, so if we look at the next image, which is an early image, what, from um, 1998, right? Yeah. So here you are using a bicycle tire patching kit found in a tool shed to patch up a group of mushrooms that had small tears on the caps, which leads us to the next piece, which I think is more well-known, which is your piece on uh, mending spider webs. And again, I want to just show these to people. We can, we, what, I, what I'm doing is pushing us forward a bit because we want to spend a lot of time at the end on one of her particular projects, but thinking about rescue and attention and care. So finally to something that she wrote, I think people don't necessarily know, know that she's also a writer and she published this wonderful <laughs> that's, piece. That's, that's pushing it a bit. <laughs> well, <laughs> You have written and published. So there you I go. write sometimes. <laughs> you write sometimes. And here is, and they'll put it in the, um, oh God, in the chat, one of the great tiny essays. It was written in 2002, and it was on this wonderful, um, sadly gone sculpture uh, that you used to walk by. And you, again, it was your use of attention. It was your use of care. And I want you to talk a bit about what happened when, when, with this and why. Yeah, I used to pass this on the corner of, what is it? It's, it's in downtown Brooklyn, J Street, and like oh, almost to that place where the, um, where Flatbush, it's almost, I guess it's almost like J Street and Flatbush, but, but this poor sculpture was just constantly being humiliated by construction around it or 
um, you know, it, it had this kind of sighting on the on the corner, but it kind of needed more space than it had been given. So it always felt it was trying to sort of be grandiose and wasn't really given the arena to be grandiose. Um, it was maybe also kind of of a scale where had it been three times as big and in front of a very big bank building, it would have had a certain kind of muscle, but um, it was a little too small for that and a little too um, sort of eager to fit in. I don't know, you can tell I anthropomorphize the hell out of it constantly. And one of the days um, passing it, I noticed that this caution tape had been tied to it. And that was almost like the poor thing is being just basically treated like, you know, a sawhorse. So um, I spent many years kind of observing this thing and then decided to, to write about it. Um, it turns out that it has obviously a maker, Alan Mooney, the sculptor who made this. And it was, it was the, the title of the sculpture was, sculpture was Iroquois Walk. Um, I always thought of it as a kind of orphan. Um, and now because they've gone and renovated like crazy um, that particular corner, it's gone. I don't know where it lives these days, but you know, I think as I wrote in that piece, I always hoped, you know, or thought, imagined that this sculpture wanted to sort of be put out to pasture at Storm King. So maybe now, maybe it's grazing. Oh, there. that would be the best if they if they did that exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah. And it's Poor also, orphan. It's that history also of that kind of plop art, kind of, you know, that minimal. And it is this it's a very, it's a very amusing and 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 as you say, forlorn. So anyway, so I read that and again it 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 it's that philosophy of you walk through the world and you're constantly paying attention and you're thinking and she turns this into her art. Um, so um, maybe we, we will skip talking about um, the video of um, uh, the re-carcassing ceremony, but you people should, should look at that. And we'll go straight to um, see the assignment because here is what, one of the things you're most famous for, right? And I want people to know that it has many aspects to it. Um, we'll get to the finish Flemish, the Flemish portraits, which are legendary, but I will. I want you to talk about it. well. Why it's particularly important now is because you made them, as you say, because you're taking all of these trips. Why don't you talk about it? What sure. happened? So, I mean, the the starting point for this, as as happens often with me, is that I had no intentions of you know, now I'm beginning an artwork. This is now a project. Like I, I was just doing things. I was on a plane. I was about to fly to Atlanta. I sat down in my seat and I thought, you know, I have two and a half hours ahead of me. And why is it that this time already doesn't count? It already is time that like, we're all eager to kind of get rid of and um, have it pass as quickly as possible without us experiencing it or <laughs> having to be here. Um, and I thought that's sort of a terrible attitude for somebody such as myself who likes to try to make an argument um, through my work, I guess, and also just in the world as a person that there is a lot of interesting stuff out there. We, you know, sort of, it's about changing our attention um, and then these things can kind of be discovered. So I thought, okay, I will just give myself the task to make things the entire way to Atlanta. And I hadn't planned this, therefore I only had what I had. I had my cell phone, I had the in-flight magazine, I had whatever things were in my bag. And I got to work and, you know, a few hours later, there were some things that had happened. I, I didn't think necessarily anything brilliant had happened, but it felt like the start of something that I needed to keep pursuing. And this project is now in its 11th year. Um, many, many things have happened. The images that you've just been sort of taken through rather quickly will, you know, they, they are me using the snacks placed on the in-flight magazine. That was that first image. Um, this one, which, okay, we're going back. Yes, so pretzel crumbs on a picture of a winding highway going through the Blue Ridge Mountains. The next one is a stack of green peas on a topiary garden, a picture of a topiary garden printed in the airline magazine. Uh, and let's see, what was, oh yeah, that's a sick finger. Uh, fingers I've discovered look really strange out of context. So I really often like using my finger in this way that messes with the scale of things and isolates my finger as a character. Um, and that's the guy sitting next to me who one can, uh, one can use the shiny belt buckle as a kind of spy camera. And I realize this is somewhat intrusive. Um, 
they never know what's happening because, because, and this is important, I just look like a bored person. I look like a bored person playing with my cell phone. And that's sort of exactly the thing I'm trying not to be. So I often say that my, my alibi is also sort of, um, the, it, it's sort of part and parcel of the whole attitude towards this project. Um, and, and as I said, towards, uh, as you know, and towards a way of living, and again, very relevant to it, like we're all stuck in our own airplane seats during the pandemic, right? So, yeah, I mean, I, I think improvisation, sort of the thinking on one's feet, you know, uh, you know, flying by the seat of one's pants, if you will, in this situation, really literally, these are all things that I find very, um, I find them really useful ways of working as an artist. I like to kind of be sometimes forced a little bit under duress, perhaps time pressure or or seeming lack of materials to to have to make it up a bit, and sometimes in that space of making it up, um, you know, acting even a little recklessly or improvis improvising a little recklessly, like one discovers things. And so, um, I can say maybe later a little bit about some things like that that have happened to me during the pandemic. And I have two little show and tell items in the room here next to me that we maybe we'll get to by the end, but. Um, so, yeah. So how many, so estimate how many flights at this point that, that you've done this with? Well, you know, this is becoming, I must say, slowly the shameful thing, because if, you know, this project has taught me many things. It has also shown me back with glaring horror, my carbon footprint and the amount of flying oh, that I've done yes. in the last 10 years. It's, it's awful. It's truly awful. And during this pandemic year where I contributed very little to this project because I was not on airplanes, basically. Um, I don't know. I've been sort of thinking about whether there's something in that that I actually want to actively respond to. But how many flights? I mean, I'd say well over 300. And I mean, I count a flight not as a round trip, but as sort of each leg. Each leg of a trip is a flight. Um, so yeah, there's been a lot of flying. And the flying that I do is primarily professional. It's, um, I do take vacations now and then and I go and see my family, but most of these trips have been work trips. Um, I want to say something about the image that's up here right now, though, because this is sort of an important one to me. Um, there is a lot of levity and play and all kinds of things like that going on in seat assignment, and we're going to get to the Flemish portraits in a second, which are certainly kind of full of a lot of that. But there are also aspects to this project that I'm very interested in that have and that are important to me that have to do with the kind of anxiety of travel and the sort of climate of the airplane and being on a plane, which I think has changed quite drastically. And um, this image came about through reading a magazine on my lap and coming across this ad, which I found weird to begin with, this kind of dark hole of a face in the middle of this hoodie figure. Um, I found it a disturbing image for a lot of reasons. And then it had a sort of interplay with the safety on board card that made me think about racial profiling, all kinds of ways that I think since 9-11, particularly this, this suspicion of people towards one another increased like crazy. Um, I tore three little holes through the face of this character to create a kind of face that, um, I don't know, I found on one hand kind of perhaps sinister, on the other hand kind of comical. It was sort of sat in this weird place. But, you know, it deserves to be said that part of what allows me to get away with making this project is, is the fact that I'm a middle-aged white woman. Like those are helpful things to, one becomes rather invisible in these situations um, when you have that, that profile yourself, I'd say. So, um, Thanks to, to the Flemish, the laboratory portraits, which right. are, yeah. So, yeah, I also got away with making a lot of images in the airplane bathroom um, and, and the same parameters apply. I don't, I, I'm not allowed to bring a bunch of things with me. I have to use what I have. So here you can see I have a styrofoam cup from the meal service on the back of my head and my eye mask. Um, that's probably a paper towel on my head. I never use toilet paper. I have sort of a principled thing about that. Um, and then I'm, I've wrapped a shawl around my shoulders. That's kind of this travel blanket I always take with me because the airline one always grosses me out a bit. But I've hung the airline one up behind me as kind of a backdrop. They continue to show more. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. Paper towels, um, tissue paper seat covers, very useful. You'll notice the paper towel on my head in the right-hand picture is, is kind of wet. I mean, these are really 
they're very, um, uh, they're kind of sloppy, I will say. I think they're kind of sloppy. They're, they're made quickly. And, and what's, I think, interesting to people, as I've been sort of for years trying to gauge the reactions to these, is that all the tricks are shown to you. There's nothing mysterious about what's going on here. You can tell pretty much everything that's been used. But in the way they all come together, they kind of leap into another category of, you know, things I've seen in museums or paintings. I've, I've never made a painting in my life. And there's something thrilling about having kind of made a painting using a cell phone in an airplane bathroom. This is maybe my way of being, you know, cheating and joining the painters for a second. And they also, they, they went viral, right? And there's now- Many times, many you times. The next one, Nick, I think it has my, that, my the one on the right, well, both. Oh, the one just, with the inflatable pillow. <laughs> you know, it's a strange thing. It's been very, very nice for me that these pictures have had such a viral, crazy life that people saw them so much. And they, you know, the, my website almost crashed in 2011, the first time they kind of went viral. but. It's also been a dilemma because I don't think that um, it's necessarily very easy for an art project to sustain, to kind of exist in its full form when people are engaging it in this, you know, click, 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 entertainment minded way online. And so I have spent a lot of energy over the years trying to sort of rope these back into the context that they come out of, which, which is full of a lot of more serious questions for me about what you can do with nothing, a kind of optimism about what is out there in the everyday. Um, yeah, like a, a lot of things. I could talk about just this project for the time that we have, but um, yeah. anyway. Okay, well, yeah, so we'll, we'll move on and, and, and okay. maybe on, 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 uh, people can look online. So the occasion for our conversation is actually a, a show that is up at this moment in New York at Pace. Um, called Cumulus. And so this first image we're seeing is part of the installation. Um, it has, what, four or five of your projects. And, and to, as people can see, many of her projects are ongoing, right? So this paranormal postcards has been shown in different places um, and each iteration is different. So mm -hmm. why don't you briefly tell us about, about this? Sure. So. Um... It's sort of a travel story also. I was in the Oslo airport on a layover in 1997. And because that was the summer I was working on that spider web stuff you guys saw earlier, I had a spool of red thread and a needle and yeah, those sewing supplies in my bag with me. And, and so it was a long layover and I went to the gift shop and I bought a postcard, a couple postcards. And then again, as sort of a way of passing the time, I decided to stitch through one of them. And this picture was of a guy standing high up on a Norwegian fjord, and there were a couple of cruise ships in this bay below. I don't think we have a picture of this one, but I connected him, the guy on the fjord cliff, to these boats, and it suddenly kind of changed the dynamic. It looked like he was controlling them, or it looked like there was some kind of connection or communication or empathy between them. Um, so I just kept stitching postcards. And for years, I sewed postcards from museum shops, from, from travels, you know, curiosity shops, gift shops, wherever I happened to go and find good postcards. And amassed this collection that by 2000, 2001, I was finally able to kind of show for the first time. And I've shown this piece really only a handful of times. It's really massive. <laughs> and it's now, there are over 400 postcards in this piece. And um, I'm, yeah, that's a good, that's a, that, at the far wall there, you see um, the very first one, which is that guy with the boats, I decided to kind of start chronologically. Um, and then this whole world kind of expands from this, I group the postcards to draw out affinities between postcards. And then I group, um, I connect the groups to other groups with this network of dotted red lines that kind of then interpolate things further. And the logic is kind of a shifting logic. Um, sometimes it's thematic, sometimes it's formal. Unlike the way that most charts are supposed to behave, it doesn't have a kind of, um, you know, informational, um, consistent kind of informational endpoint at all. So <laughs> while it's been up at pace, it's been really fun to watch people kind of peruse the thing and, and come up with their own reasons why one card is next to another or one group connects to a different one. Um, and I have a reason for all of them. There's a very concrete reason why everything is where it is. And I think sometimes that is discernible and other times it's maybe a little bit more opaque. But Thursa, you had some, <laughs> I, want yeah. to, I want you to tell people about the ones you picked out because you had great 
things right. to say. Right. Well, well, yeah. <laughs> I, I, anybody who's in New York, you have to go because it's such a pleasure to sort of take and go from beginning to end. And I just was giggling madly throughout it because of, say, for instance, the one we just saw. Pre yeah. David Bowie and God knows what and God knows what, right? Um, 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 it's just beautiful and always the thread. Um, the, the, the next shot too. Uh, in this one, in, wait, go yeah. back a second. Yeah. In that one, by the way, like the thread's being lifted. So you, it's like Bowie, I think it's a Moreau in the That's middle right. actually. Yep. So yep. it's uh, 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 yeah. Yeah, and, and, and we have um, actually, you could go skip the next one and go to the, that one, yeah, my favorite. Um, I've been using this one to, to publicize our conversation because he's, he's like, you know, working out, right, right? right. right. So, so all these different, the, the threads tell different stories based on different different images. And um, Nick, the next one, uh, the, these are our friends who've been <laughs> in the news so much. And um, I really love the one in the middle where you have uh, the queen and her eye is really looking at all of his medals, right? It's yeah. Um, you, can you know, it, th this also becomes a kind of reflection of, of what, of course, as postcards always are, of, of what each place, each country, each culture wants you to kind of know about them summed up somehow in an image or two. So, you know, <laughs> I love going to the UK because you get tons of these royal family cards. It's, you know, everywhere. Um, and you and have a lot of middle, royals too from other countries. Yes, I've, I, there's a whole royals kind of a yeah royals section in the in the piece. But you know the middle one with Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip, it's actually kind of interesting. Or wait, did I? Is that right, Prince Philip? Yeah. That suddenly sounds strange. Okay, um, who recently died? And so you know when I looked at this card recently, it felt like she's trying to sort of pull him back to her or something. Like it suddenly became kind of a sad, different image to me. Um, she might want to purchase it for herself to have a little <laughs> to remember him by. Um, we'll let her know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, moving on as I, as we as you can tell, right? And then there's all these wonderful ones of, of, of New York City and there's, yeah, there's a lot there's of New York. A lot of New York. I'd actually love to tell you the story of that lower one because this this is something very interesting, I think, about postcards at the moment, but also New York at the moment, which is that Maybe a day before we had to finish the install, I had been walking to Chelsea and sort of looking at Hudson Yards every time I walked down 25th Street. And um, it was actually my first trip to New York where I went to Hudson Yards. I hadn't stepped foot in that place yet. And um, I kept looking at that viewing platform that's called The Edge, where people were standing up there. And, and one day I thought, I've got to get a postcard of The Edge. I need like threads going from the people on that viewing platform like down to other things. So I went to Hudson Yards and um, was told by a friendly guard that there was the Edge gift shop. And <laughs> I was like, oh yes, there are going to be so many great postcards up there of this thing. This is gonna be a jackpot. And I went up there and the only postcard they sell is that one on the bottom, which isn't even a view of the city. It's like a logo or it's you know a vector drawing of a space. It's barely a place. It's kind of a concept of a place. <laughs> So I, I found that initially disappointing and then actually decided that it was quite telling, quite interesting and um, connected the viewing platform in that card to the tips of the other tall buildings around it. Um, and then paired it with a view of, you know, the bottom part of Manhattan, which looks sort of in a way equally impossible in this view, this kind of shiny, abstract almost city. So that's the story of these two. Yeah, and she has ones that are wonderful where the, the, the strings are go, you know, from a building down to look at all the boats that are around. So it, 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 there's tons and tons. The next one shows us, there's also a collection of animals. You have a lot of, um, we didn't, didn't put them in antlers, but- um, Yeah, a lot of antlers. This is one that Pace um, featured. Um, that <laughs> will act, we'll, we'll come back to us when we're talking about the shipwreck at the end and yes, uh, yes. The sea and, and animals. Okay, so, um, okay, next uh, at the Pace Gallery is this also um, uh, ongoing project called the Genealogy of the Supermarket. <sighs> All right, so I think you people can see that this is again another, this is literally a genealogy. And a, um, if we of, a have a, <laughs> of a sort. Of a sort. So, We'll move to the next one because the there's so many connections that she makes, and the one that I sort of decided that we could we could focus on is the famous one, whereas I called it um, Quaker Oats to the Girls. 
of the Quaker Oats Men. So maybe start at the right with what kind of a genealogy is. So who is this woman on that goes to and then who is at the right of? Sure. Um, I, and on and on. I'll tell you who's who, but maybe I, I could say a little bit about just the logic of this piece. So it, it um, since 2005, which is when I made it initially, um, what I did, and it really, again, was born out of a moment in a supermarket, like shopping for groceries, where I thought, all these people who appear on food products, I mean, what is this fantasy that's sort of behind this, this idea that, you know, the Italian grandmother on the pasta sauce jar is like, my grandmother who made this for me or something like this, and I have no Italian grandmothers in my own family at all. And, and so I, I found myself sort of starting to pay attention to this and gradually, um, it was taking a long time to shop for groceries because I kept looking and looking and looking for more people and, and collecting them. And finally, with enough of them, I could interpolate them into this big family, taking sort of taking the fantasy at face value as literally as possible. I would, would make them into one big family. So, um, so it's a process of kind of matchmaking, you know, like who looks like they might you know, with this person and this person, they might have sort of produced this child. Like I'm always looking for kind of family resemblances. Um, and um, and the section of the piece you're looking at here, uh, okay, now I have to strain my memory to remember. On the upper left is a sort of like a tea person. He's like a English kind of tea guy. I married him off to Marie Callender, who is a pie brand that um, I grew up with in California. I'm not sure if she's like nationwide or not. Um, their child ends up being, um, uh, oh, the, the tea guy's name is PC Larkin, I just remembered. And their son is a guy named something Sanders or Saunders who, um, is a kind of James, no, sorry, James Sharwood. <laughs> and he has this kind of tikka, tikka fry sauce. So I, I, I kind of thought, okay, he's wearing that helmety thing. He's probably some, you know, went to the colonies kind of British guy. This was the story I told myself, where then he met the woman on the celestial seasonings box, who is South Asian. Um, and they, their child is a real person actually, whose name is Jyoti and she, She's a very amazing woman who started a food brand um, of canned Indian food that is widely used on airlines, believe it or not. So I often order the Indian vegetarian meal when I fly and I'm sure I've eaten her food on a plane. Um, anyway, it goes from there. But the thing I'd also love to call your attention to because this was a new thing I did this year um, is that four of the characters you see here, Aunt, Aunt Jemima, easy to recognize, Uncle Ben, and then the cream of wheat chef and the land of lakes um, so-called Indian maiden, whose name is actually Mia, her brand name. Um, I decided I needed to do something to address the fact that the, their parent companies have taken them off the brand packaging because for reasons I think are well justified, they, they came out of racist stereotypes that, that were um, offensive and upsetting and, and really should, um, should have been taken off, I think, a long time ago. So, but what did I wanna do about that? Was, was, I gonna take, was I gonna take these people out of the chart? Was I going to um, have some kind of footnote? Like I spent a long time debating this and had some really, I, I, I'm indebted to several very smart friends who I, I called and had conversations with and sort of, thought this through with and decided in the end that um, the solution would be to sort of gray and and sort of blur them out. So it's difficult to see in this picture, but when you see it in real, if you see it in real, they've kind of occupied this space now where it feels to me, I hope, a little like they're trying to both push their way forward at the same time as some kind of force is maybe trying to push them back. And the way I've been thinking about it is that I don't think that the fact that they've been on the packaging this way has really been contended with. I think there's a lot more discussion and thinking to do about the fact that they were there this way in the first place. And so I don't want the brands, I guess, to get away with um, just sort of sweeping it under the rug and saying, now we're woke and it's great and we have someone else, you know, we took them off, it's, it's all okay, right? I kind of don't feel like it should be quite that easy. So that this was sort of my way of, of taking this on and, um, yeah, yeah and, and showing again a genealogy that results in real people as well. Um, 
um, and the way that, you know, what this is where I see many have seen your work also has a kind of a critical, a critical conceptual edge because yeah. you know, this is obviously about consumer culture and imagery. I mean, it's so rich again in, a, in our short conversation. I mean, you could just sit here and bring a classroom of children in. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and sit here and wow, a whole master class on American culture, consumerism, race, class. Uh, colonialism um, on and on. So. Well, it's it's all in there already. I think that's kind of the kind of stuff I'm interested in is, you know, just look at what's already there in front of us that we can pull all these things out of. And so, you know, I mean, this might be also a good place to say that humor, which I use a lot and I'm asked about a lot, is a very useful device. You know, this piece, I think, initially comes across as a kind of like fun, maybe even one linery sort of thing. But you know, it's very, um, I sometimes like to say like humor allows me to sort of bring you in and then kind of close the door behind you. And then actually to have a kind of, you know, a conversation about something that I think is urgent. And you know, the last many years have, have sort of, we don't even need to go there, but this country has been roiling in, in questions related to these questions. So yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, one could write an essay talking about all the stuff that's in here, but instead you do it visually. Um, and um, um, what was I going to say? Um, oh, that, you wanted to know about the the younger generation, yeah, though. The, sort of, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's some. <laughs> there are a lot of guys who make barbecue sauce. I'll just say <laughs> there are oh. a lot of them. Right. White, black, they are like, there are many of them all across the tree. But here we have on the far left, left Stubbs um, and the cowboy hat. And then there's another guy, Shaka. He's the one married to La Morena, who's the woman, um, a, a, a pickled um, pepper woman um, in the oval frame. And then, he, and then the two women next to him are a soap brand and a hair color brand. And then the, the Foxy woman looking over her shoulder is married to Earl Campbell, who's a former NFL player who now, I think, also has a barbecue sauce. <laughs> so that's, and okay. it goes on from there. You're not seeing the, the youngest children, but. Right, exactly. Um, yeah, and, and, and again, this is sort of that idea of humor breaking open an entire uh, 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 critical history of all of the different relationships that are going on and back to this idea of of the marvelous and what I said with Breton, convulsing reality. This is our reality. Okay, so breaking it open um, and 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 analyzing it. All right, let's do the shift. Sorry to keep going so quickly, but um, we're doing pretty good with time. The next piece is is a very now well known piece um, that um, accent elimination that is also at pace. So please go. Uh, it's also available online. You can you can. Um, so talk about it a bit and um, or tell us about it, please. Sure. So now having worked with this fantasy family, now we're, we're getting into my actual family. <laughs> and and um, here you see my parents and I uh, 16 years ago um, in a situation I put us all in, which my parents gamely participated in. I have very nice parents who have been roped into artworks several times. Um, and what we're trying to do is to learn to speak with each other's accents. Um, that is a complicated task because my parents have each grown up in wildly different places, in cultures within other cultures, in small countries where they learn a lot of languages because they often want to um, live or work in other places. And so without getting, without sort of reiterating the entire piece, um, this is a, a circumstance in each of their lives that has led to people constantly asking them, where is your accent from? And that question opens up onto more questions and more questions and more questions. It's not a simple answer. And I've been hearing them sort of do this explanation um, my entire life. And I have never been able to imitate either of their accents. So all these things kind of came together in a sense. Um, when I first moved to New York, I started noticing posters that advertised a service called accent elimination, which struck me as both interesting and slightly disturbing. <laughs> like who's, who's eliminating what and why? Um, but I decided to call one of these coaches and sort of learn more about who did this and what, what this was for. And long story short, eventually ended up working with him. You see the next image, Nick? Yeah. Shows us the Thank you. Yeah. We took lessons with Sam Schwa, who's here in his amazing, very messy office with lots of actors 
headshots on the walls because that's primarily who he coached actually were actors. Um, but he's teaching me to speak with my father's um, Armenian accent. That's a very shorthand way of describing his accent. And then my mother's Finnish Swedish accent. And he is trying to teach them to speak with a so-called standard American accent. And that is already a kind of can of worms thing <laughs> to decide what that would be. So um, Sam, who um, came from deepest Brooklyn, spoke an, Eng uh, an American English that sounded really different from my West Coast California English. So we had sort of a weird discrepancy, an interesting discrepancy in the room, even from the get-go. So in this piece, you, uh, you watch us struggle and struggle and struggle to complete this, try to succeed in this very difficult task. And it's certainly much more about watching us struggle than watching us succeed. Um, and, and, and we... Yeah, the, the story of, of, of that nobody's identity, you know, is, 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 is what it looks like at all. And there's that great moment with your father who what was Armenian, but grew up in Beirut. Um, yep. Lived in France, I think. But, and then there's this moment when you say in your accent, asking him, you know, and, and so what do people think your accent is? <laughs> he says Hungarian. They, um, yeah, the people usually think he's Hungarian. That's kind of the punchline. Yeah, and my, yeah. my parents, I should say, they each wrote the scripts that we're working with. So these were really sort of their stories and their words. And um, it's known also because it was part of the Armenian pavilion, right? At the Venice. In Venice, Pavilion's. yeah. Yeah. And in, that, that the whole pavilion won the um, Golden Lion, and this was part of it. And so that's fantastic because so lots about the diaspora and so on and so forth. So um all right, we're just doing the perfect timing because uh, <laughs> let's move on to, this is the last piece that, that of the show. I mean, there's other pieces in the show. There's one about cat whiskers and so on and so forth. So there's other things to see in the show, but talk about this piece because it's a new piece. And it's also- Yeah, a new piece that took many years to finish actually. And um, you're looking at a print of a um, an embroidered, object, which um, an embroidery sampler, um, it's probably about, I don't know, maybe like 10 by 13 inches in size. And it was made by um, a, the person who I refer to as my bonus grandmother, Lucy. Um, Lucy was uh, an Armenian genocide orphan who was, who was orphaned we probably around 1914, 15. It's, it's hard to say. She um, never knew her actual given name. She never knew her biological family, um, had no idea of any of these biographical details. Um, when these calamities were going on in Turkey, um, she, she, she lost everything. She lost uh, everything and ended up in an orphanage in, in Lebanon, where eventually she was sort of taken into my grandparents' home before my father was born. But there's lots to say about this. But this object was one of the one of the few things from her early childhood that survived and which I encountered, you know, actually only once she was gone. She died in 2001. And my mother framed this for me and gave this to me and said, you know, this is something I thought you would appreciate. And it was an embroidery sampler, sampler that Lucy as a girl had made to practice these stitches that um, these girls were being taught needlepoint skills and sewing and these kinds of things in the orphanage with, you know, the hopes that maybe for some of them they would find work as a, as a you know, domestic help in the house kind of situation. Um, Lucy was really, really good at all these sewing arts and, um, and did them her entire life. But what I do in this print is to sort of replicate her sampler by placing a piece of plexiglass over the original object and then scratching out every one of her stitched marks with this little engraving tool, which I don't really know how to use when I begin making this. Like I'm sort of learning it as I go. And in that sense, it's kind of akin to her own um, sewn marks. So it's sort of one sampler in homage to another sampler and then a short text that talks about what I just told you, but also makes note of the fact that she was someone who basically cared for other people her entire life. Like she took care of all of us who knew her and um, cooked for us and fixed our clothes and crocheted us beautiful things and mended things. And, and um, there was a kind of caretaking and labor that I think rarely goes recognized when people do that. And, um, and I wanted to acknowledge that. 
so the story is so extraordinary of her of her history which yeah. is a blip in the moment of your life and of everyone's life and so rich um and you manage to transform it into mm. this object that we can appreciate for what it is that she did what it is that you're doing mm. and you bring her back I, I take it she's probably passed away at this point. yeah already in 2001 so a while ago um although you know she did she did crochet me a wedding dress <laughs> long before I had any intentions of getting married. And she said, she would sometimes guilt trip me and say like, you have a dress, you know, like you you should, you should get married in it. You have it. Uh, I do. And, and in fact, when, when my uh, husband and I did eventually get married 15 years after we met, I wore it, I wore it to Brooklyn city hall. So she never saw that, but you know, that's it's an amazing, it's an amazing thing. I mean, it's an artwork, what she made. It's we need astonishing. A, we need a photograph of that. <laughs> <laughs> she would have been horrified that I also wore my black leather lace-up boots with it, but that's what I felt like getting married in. So, you know. Of course. Okay. So um, we're now going to move to the last project we're going to talk to talk about, which is the one you're working on now, which is really extraordinary. And um, it's about she'll she'll go into it it's about um it's about a, a shipwreck that story that she was she was re read but I also want to bring up there's a quote in in the catalog where you say take away my art books but you, you never take away my shipwreck books right yeah so so again we're back to the rescue recovery mm. um and the reason you know the the story of the um that we skipped over of, of you and your brother right um um was also about that child all those those figures you made and it's this very vivid story of this is in the the um the place on the coast of, of finland mm -hmm. and you watched as he went towards the the edge of the of the water and was almost swept away and you described this sort of horror and so in 2016 you came back and made a video about that but i just thought that it again shows there's there's a really deep interest in uh this sense of of of, of wreckage and um go on so now tell yeah. us yeah um this story the story could also alone be like our entire time together here but That's i'll try to make it quick yeah, 15 minutes. yeah um i was read a book when i was seven years old by my mother um, called Survive the Savage Sea. You're looking at stills from a video that is sort of, that I call the orientation video, which is sort of the first piece that a viewer encountered when they came to see this exhibition that I had in January at Catherine Clark Gallery in San Francisco. And um, this book was a bestseller at the time. It was a year when um, my family lived in, in England. My dad had a sabbatical and we went to the UK for a year and um, my mother sort of encountered it there. It was written by the father of a, um, a, 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 a an English farming family, family of farmers who decided to sell their farm, spend all their money on a, a, a sailboat and take their kids on a sort of multi-year voyage around the world. Um, these folks were not wealthy. They, they really sold everything they had to buy the sailboat. And the father was really the only one who had had any experience at sea. He had spent a good decade as a merchant marine working at sea. So he, he, had, he had experience, nobody else did. Um, and they plunge in to this, to this adventure. And a year after, about a year and a half into their four year trip, they have just passed through the Panama Canal they have visited the Galapagos Islands and they are about to cross the Pacific on the next big stretch of their trip when a pod of orca um, smash the sailboat and sink it and they wind up adrift. And there are five adults, um, sorry, there are, there are four adults and two kids um, on a very small inflatable uh, raft with an even smaller tiny fiberglass dinghy that they're towing behind them that they eventually end up having to move into because the raft sinks. Um, so the book is an account of this of this ordeal that the Robertson family went through. And I have been reading and rereading and rereading and rereading this book since I was seven years old. It's a point of complete obsession for me. And um, I read lots and lots and lots of, of other true accounts of shipwrecks. Um, and I have my whole life sort of had this intention, had this intention of one day maybe sort of doing something about the story or with the story. And last um, March or April, as I started to have to have an answer for um, 
my wonderful longtime gallerist in San Francisco, Catherine Clark, who wanted to have a, sh we hadn't done a solo show in a long time and I, I, it was sort of time to do one. I kind of said like, I think this is the story I need to work on right now. Like it's a pandemic, we're all shipwrecked in some way, collectively, individually. This is the suddenly is now the, now is the right time to work on this. And um, I got up my nerve to do something I'd also been meaning to do for a long time, which was to contact Douglas Robertson, who is the son of the person who wrote this book. Douglas was 18 at the time they were cast adrift and um, has also written his own book about this. And I wrote him an email and heard back from him and we agreed, um, it was actually his suggestion <laughs> that for 38 days, which is the length of time they were shipwrecked, he and I would have a daily conversation on the very day um, that, that like th this is a 38 day account, um, the book. And so on June 15th, when they were shipwrecked, he and I started our conversation um, and proceeded every 38 days to talk on the phone um, for an hour, sometimes for two hours, sometimes for 20 minutes. But we went through the entire thing together and it was an unbelievable experience. It was very emotional for him often. Um, my role in this story maybe kind of began a little bit like a kind of journalist researcher, but it shifted as we went and as we came to also know each other. Um, there are a million things to say about this, but it resulted in an exhibition. Catherine Clark Gallery's website has a lot of really great material still online about it. There's a Zoom walkthrough of the whole show. Um, yeah. But, you know, it, it is, I guess, another instance of sort of you know, thinking about survivors, survival. I think Lucy having been a family member of mine made me in some weird oblique way really interested in this story. Um, what do people do when they're in a situation like this? I mean, how the hell do you improvise when you're six adults in a, or six people in this nine foot long fiberglass dinghy in the Pacific Ocean? I mean, that is a kind of pressure that, you know. There's a photograph of you in the- um, <laughs> Yeah, in yeah. The, yeah. Yeah, so I'm lying. I painted the um, outline of the dinghy on the floor and I'm lying in it just to show you, you know, the scale of this thing. Um, four adults and two children in this. And when they were all in it, there was about six inches of the boat above the water line. Like that's how low it was in the water through storms, through sharks constantly circling them, all kinds of weather. It's, it's totally astonishing how they get through this what they talk about, how they catch food, how they get water, all of those sorts of things. Um, and you how know- How did you turn this into an exhibition? Like how did you, yeah. what were you focusing on? It was really hard. It was hard the same way that it's hard to work with family material for me because you know, frankly, who cares? I mean, there's a kind of who cares aspect. I think anytime you work with something you're really, really obsessed with, or this is the fear for me, it's like, I care, but how do you make it open to other people? How do you make it generous? How do you let, allow access in? Um, so, you know, the structure I decided on was, it wasn't obvious to me for a long time and suddenly it was, but I thought, you know, it's a 38 day account and we had a 38 day conversation and this exhibition will have a 38 day structure. And I will just allow people to kind of follow along both the story and the conversation about the story. Um, and so there are lots of audio excerpts of our conversations. Um, I think well over 70 um, short, short clips of which nobody is, it's not intended that you should engage them all, although some people did, several people did. And, um, and artifacts, I've remade replicas of things they had on the raft with them. Um, I have a paper- image before this, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, please. Yeah. There we so, go. Yeah, yeah, I made paper replicas of a lot of the animals they encountered. Um, this is a life-size paper orca that I made in my very small studio here in Berlin and then mailed to Douglas in London who unfolded it and took it out into his garden to have a picture taken and, this, and then texted me this picture which cracked me up. Um, but doing this was a way for me to try to get close to this. Like how big is an orca? What does it mean to be in the water with a pot of orca? And it, you know, when I saw the size of this thing, I realized, my God, it was terrifying. And, in one of the audio clips, um, he talks about unpacking this orca and seeing that patch of gray on the orca's back. And as he puts it in his words, you know, a chill went down my back because I remembered being in the water with them and I hadn't thought about that 
in a really long time. So I made, I made paper animals also of everything they caught and ate. If you go to the next slide, I think there was an image of, um, those are Dorado, those are made of wire, but um, that those are also life size. But the next slide has a lot of paper, oops, paper turtles, sharks. They actually caught a shark more or less with their bare hands. Um, yeah, shark Dorado turtles is what they subsisted on. Um, so I'm showing this project again in um, late August at the Columbus Museum of Art in Columbus, Ohio, in case anyone is there. And it's also gonna travel to Pace London in summer 2022, which is incredibly exciting for me because it will be the 50th anniversary year of the shipwreck and all the Robertsons of there are there and I have never met them. So oh gosh, this is great. We're gonna have a big, finally, finally, like a reunion of sorts. It's funny to have a reunion with people you've never met, but that's how it feels to me. Um, oh, fantastic. Will there be a, 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 a book catalog that goes with it? Not that we've planned, but who knows? I, I know, I'm always, um, um, you know, at some point I will share my, uh, I have a great grandfather who was shipwrecked that became a very famous story oh. that a documentary was made oh. out of. So, oh. so we will discuss this at some yes, point. Yes, please. And, and that's a that's a little teaser for everyone else. <laughs> that's right, amazing. We're, we're, um, we're close, we're close to um, two o'clock. So why don't we talk about what you described as what you're doing in 2023? Yeah. Spelunking through spelunking, the spelunking in the Morgan Library. I feel extremely lucky <laughs> to get to do this. Um, Joel Smith, who's the photography curator at the Morgan, the first photography curator that they've had, um, has invited me to be the third in a series of exhibitions um, where it's sort of a so-called artist choice show, where you know an artist comes in and goes and looks through many many kinds of things in the Morgan's vast collection, and then. Together, he and I are kind of making a show that puts some of my work into conversation with these, these things. Um, so we've had, a, I don't know, maybe like five, six now of these sort of spelunking, um, you know, meetings where we spend a couple hours um, with the help of the many, many different Morgan curators who, who know different parts of the collection very well. But I'm just sharing a couple pictures from my last visit there, which was only a few weeks ago. And um, we were looking at children's games, board games, and then the curator had also taken out these so-called tunnel books. I had never heard of this genre, but it's like a very weird, sorry? I'm sorry, next slide, yeah. Yeah, this is like a very weird, almost early form of virtual reality, where you take this book and sort of stretch it out. And then when you look through it, it's it's a little bit like, um, um, what is it called? The, the images that have like two stereoscopic images. So you have this kind of stereoscopic three-dimensional effect of, of looking um, through this book. The thing that I love so much about the tu this tunnel book is that it's a tunnel book about a tunnel <laughs> that they're going to build underneath the River Thames. So it's sort of supposed to show the viewer what this tunnel will be once it's done. And I think the next slide has me actually looking at, looking through it. Um, yeah, like sort of peering through the thing. I'm not sure if you were supposed to do it this way or sort of prop it up on something and look through it horizontally, but um, but it, it's a pretty amazing good illusion when you're when you're all lined up right with it. So there are zillions of incredible things in that place, as you can imagine. And I'm, um, I mean, it's a really fun kind of looking and thinking and. Um, I think we're just trying to fill our brains with, with um, objects and, and sort of, you know, with enough of them, then I think the kind of synapses will start to fire and find one another. The connections will be made. The red thread lines will be drawn <laughs> eventually. Exactly. You know, it reminds me of um, uh, the Brothers Quay did, uh, did, were asked to do this at the Mütter Museum. And there's a documentary mm. where they too were asked to sort of quote unquote spelunk. And I happened yeah. to be there and good God, the books that they find, right? Yeah. And things like this uh, that we, we just don't know about. So we all really look forward to this. <laughs> so do I. I. Do, right? So, um, well, this has been fantastic. Um, it's such a such a quick quick trip through the wonders of, 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 of Nina's brain and work. So um, I will now uh, hand it over to Nick. Here you have the forthcoming exhibitions or, um, and, uh, we will have see what questions and things that have been Thank you. Um, coming. Thank you.
And thanks everyone Absolutely. for tuning in, by the way. I just want to say like, it's it's just super cool to see names appearing as people like entered the chat. And I, it's like, I wish I could hug you all. So. <laughs> uh, thank you both. Um, that was an amazing conversation. Nina, it's been such a pleasure working closely to your work and getting to know it. Um, before we jump fully into the Q&A, there's actually, there's two sort of interesting sort of practices practical questions out of interest for the um, Survive the Savage Sea in the chat. The one was, um, what did they do for drinking water and mm. where did they finally land? Right. Or maybe okay. the point of rescue. Yes, 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 good. Um, drinking water, big problem. <laughs> because, you know, what happens initially when, where, when they're wrecked, um, and I should maybe say, for the sake of the whales, the whales were not doing this maliciously. They probably yeah. thought the sailboat was another whale. So orcas they don't didn't attack. They did eat them, right? They could have eaten them and they didn't eat them. Now, nah, killer whales don't eat people. They don't. Oh. But they were very afraid that they would. It was, it was, that Douglas has said it was terrifying thinking that that was going to happen. Um, so where, where, they sh where they are wrecked, um, the weather there is not likely to hold a lot of rain. Um, so what they decide to do is something very counterintuitive, which is to go further north, um, following currents further north into an area known as the doldrums, which tends to get a lot of rain because they, that is their only chance at getting water, really. Um, so they do that. <laughs> and then through a combination of collecting rainwater um, and very important, like catching these Dorado, these giant fish, also known as mahi-mahi. You may have once upon a time eaten mahi-mahi. They have really big eyeballs full of water and they suck the fluid from the eyeballs, from the spinal cavity, from you know all the flesh of these fish. I mean, they're sort of getting liquid anywhere they can get it. Um, they catch sea turtles. They drink the blood of the sea turtles. Like, you know, it's a gruesome business and not one that they particularly enjoyed. But as Douglas said to me, you know, when you're in that situation, you know, you really don't know what you will do until you are in that situation. So um, that's sort of the answer to the water question. They had um, a plan in mind, which was that um, after about a week of hoping that a ship might see them and counting on that being their salvation, a ship is sighted and sh this ship does not see them. And that is such a devastating event for them psychologically that, you know, it's interesting. Other people might have at that point thrown in the towel and said, forget it. This is hopeless. We're all going to die. The Robertsons, however, they take this view of like, okay, we're not counting on anyone from now on. We are getting ourselves to land. We're going to have, it's going to be about survival, not rescue. That's the kind of much repeated phrase, survival, not rescue. And they um, decide to sort of, as best they can navigate, they don't have any tools to navigate with, they're sort of doing this based on wind currents and wind direction and drift and all kinds of things. Um, their plan is to kind of go up and gradually go north and then eventually head east where they hope to land somewhere on the coast of sort of Costa Rica, Panama, kind of somewhere around there, they hope. Um, but then in fact, on day 38, a fishing boat comes by, a Japanese fishing boat called the Tokomaru, and it sees them. And, you know, they cannot believe it's happening to them, but they get picked up. And the title of my show, To Feel Something That Was Not Of Our World, um, I took from a very beautiful, I thought, um, thing that Douglas said, he said it totally, you know, off the cuff, where um, I asked him, at what point did you actually believe you were being rescued? Because he said, we couldn't believe it. We couldn't believe it. We couldn't let our guard down and sort of allow for the possibility of be being disappointed again. And I said, well, when did you believe it? And he said, the rope. It was when the rope came over the bow and we grabbed the rope and we had that rope in our hand. And, you know, he said, to feel something that was not us, that was not of our world, that was so good. <laughs> And I kind of was like, oh my God, it's just, it's just an incredible way to express that. So I loved that phrase and I used that to be the title of the show. So they were picked up, they were saved. Um, they were taken to Panama with these amazing Japanese fishermen who were so kind to them. And um, it, it's such a beautiful couple of days on the boat together before they get, get onto land and they can't speak each other's languages at all. It's all pure pantomime. So that's the, 
I can't, I wow. can't have short answers to shipwreck questions. I'm sorry. That, that's, that's, that's <laughs> incredible. Thank you for sharing all of that. And I think I and many people in the audience, like, will be going to find this book and get a copy and read it. I recommend it. Um, okay, we're going to now jump right into the formal Q&A. First up, we have Christine Wertheim. Uh, oh, Christine, Christine hi. Uh, Christine, you should be able to turn on your mic now. There we are. Hi, Nina. Hey. I haven't got my face on. I've got very spotty um, reception here. No worries. But, um, uh, I, I, I love your work. And, you know, when you were talking about the shipwreck, I was thinking about your video piece about the toys that you and your brother played and the shipwreck that you had in that in that game. And I well, partially wondered whether you started reading shipwreck book before or after that event. But mm -hmm. my real question is, you know, one thing that fascinates me is people who use their own lives as kind of their art medium or as one of their art mediums. And, and you particularly use your, the life of your family. And I just, and, and, you know, I think it's really, it's not like life, it's not like work about life. It's the mm. life is somehow the art. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, um, I, I think that's right. I mean, I guess I'm thinking back to the comment I made earlier about how do you open it up for someone else? And um, maybe it is sort of a little bit trusting that it's never just your story in some funny way. It's sort of, you know, the sort of tendrils that, that I don't know, connect people's experiences in ways or where, you know, the Robertson story wasn't my story, but I'd had this sort of long relationship with it. And I think what the, what the concern when I was working on that show was, is that, you know, I didn't want to hijack the story from the Robertsons. It's their story. It didn't happen to me. I didn't want to make a show that was about like my experience with this book, but it becomes, the show becomes, I think in the end about a couple different things. It becomes the story of the Robertsons. And it also becomes about what it means to have a conversation with someone um, and to kind of, in a way, witness that person's story, to kind of be the one listening, what it means to listen, what it means to then sort of um, communicate a story that's been told to you through art to others. So I found myself thinking a lot about that. Like, how do you listen well? How do you, um, if there's a kind of ethics to listening, maybe, um, how could I do that? How could I do it fairly? Um, it, it was tricky at first for me to feel I knew like where my place in this was as an artist. I feel a little bit mm, allergic to projects that kind of hijack an already really interesting thing and just kind of present it as the artist's work. And I, I really hope I haven't done that with this project. It was sort of the big fear all along that, that um, if I got it wrong, then it would end up being that kind of a piece. So it's a bit roundabout, Christine, but I hope that partially addresses what you're saying. Thank you. Can I just add one? Did you ever think about Werner Herzog? Because he, as you know, works with other people's stories a great deal. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's interesting. It, of course, I've watched many of his films over the years, and he's someone whose work I, I really admire. And, you know, I'm sure it has affected how I make things and think about these things. But it's not really like until you say it now, like he hasn't specifically been on my mind. But sure, I'm sure he was on my mind back there in my head. Excellent. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, next, I'm going to pass the mic over to Beatrice. Um, and forgive me mm. if I'm not pronouncing your name with the correct pronunciation but uh, you can turn your mic on now. Hi. 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 Um, yeah, what, what really, uh, thank you. Thank you for this. It was, uh, it was very interesting and very uh, exciting to, uh, to hear this conversation and to hear about your art. Mm, um, I have partly a comment, partly a question about the, um, the art project you mentioned with uh, you taking on your parents' accents and your parents taking on your accents, I mean, each other's accents. Mm -hmm. I'm half Lebanese and I spend, mm -hmm. well, my father now has an American standard accent. My mom has a French accent, but I spend a lot of time with my Lebanese grandmother. And 
I wanted to know because I know from my experience with her, listening to her accents has been very fun and original to kind of mold her accents sometimes when I speak. Yes. Myself, of course, I will never do it with her in front of her, but I was wondering <laughs> what, what did that experience bring you and what was it like for you? Yeah, well, I can tell you something funny about Lucy, actually, um, which is that Lucy spoke a very kind of broken English. And I, without really sort of meaning to or deciding to, my brother and I began speaking her broken English with her. Like we sort of molded our English to her English when we spoke with Lucy. So it was impossible for me to speak a kind of grammatically correct English with her. Like we, we met in this kind of third space of another English when we were with Lucy always. Um, so just to sort of put that in there. Uh, so what was it like to, to, do, to, to do this with my parents? Is that what you asked, Beatrice? Yes, yes. Um, it, was, it was bewildering. It was, um, I mean, I should also say, I would never want my parents to lose their accents. I actually, um, I felt quite strongly as a kid, especially with my mother, that whenever she sort of tried to sound more American, I found it very irritating. Like it wasn't her somehow. Like to me, her accent was, was very much kind of integrated into who she was for me. And um, um, it's a very psychological thing to work with your voice. It, it comes out of your body. Um, it feels like sort of a physical thing, but it's immaterial and you kind of can't have it or get it. Or I, I sometimes thought making this piece, I thought about my parents' accents as a, a kind of heirloom I could never inherit. Um, so speaking like someone else or speak, especially someone very close to you is, um, it's very odd. It, you have to kind of try to forget yourself in some strange way. I mean, there are moments where we sat there with the coach and it felt like some odd new experimental form of, you know, family therapy. Like it was, it had some crazy moments. And there are bits and pieces of our um, experience together that have become these kind of long standing jokes. I mean, there's a, there's a line in my dad's script where he says, um, he, he, it's a line my dad wrote, but he wrote it for me to say. So it's my line and I'm supposed to say Arabic. Wow, where did you learn English? But it comes out when I try to say it with his accent as Arabic, wow. And it sounds ridiculous. It just sounds ridiculous. And, and he, he loves to imitate me saying Arabic, wow. So we go around often joking and saying Arabic, wow, Arabic, wow. And conversely in my mother's script, there's um, a moment where I, I say, that's amazing, but I, I say it more like, that's amazing. And this has become a family kind of joke, that's amazing. So there's a way in which this gets very convoluted. It's like me imitating them, imi them imitating me, imitating them, like it's a hall of mirrors situation. Um, but there have been no lasting effects of our accent study. I mean, it's important to understand that for an adult to change their accent at a certain point in time is is basically kind of it's it's not likely to happen. Like children are like sponges for this stuff, but your the, your way of speaking becomes quite ingrained. Um, and so I'm happy my parents still have the accents they have. <laughs> Thanks for your question. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, Beatrice. Uh, next, I'm going to pass the mic over to uh, Hovi Brock, real comrade. Hovi, you should be able to turn on your mic now. Uh, thank you to Thurza and Nina for such a great conversation, uh, really intelligent work. And Nina, I just wanted you to know that your work is on heavy rotation for a, a contemporary art history class that I teach <laughs> at awesome. Trinity City University. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's great work for students because it's very intelligent, but very accessible at the same time with, mm. you know, some of the inspired silliness uh, makes a very wow. easy um, access point. Anyway. Yeah. My question is uh, for the um, for the uh, uh, supermarket genealogy piece. I noticed that a lot of the characters are cartoon adjacent, but they're not quite mm. cartoons. Yeah. Um, and and you know, uh, um, upper uppermost in mind, uh, John Oliver had a great piece on um, uh, cereals, and so on cereal boxes you have all these cartoon characters. I, I just wondered, was there? something conscious and like trying to stay as close as possible to 
actual people as opposed to cartoon characters. Yeah, yeah, it was kind of a rule. Like I decided um, a person couldn't be too cartoony or too, too like animals I ruled out too. Um, I guess the idea was that I wanted you to really be able to feel a kind of like identification with the person like you could picture you know which I realized later like maybe this is very anthropocentric <laughs> like maybe some people do feel related to animals um, but that was the rule and so it's funny people often ask like what about the Pillsbury Doughboy it's like well mm, no I think I think he's too cartoony or what are, there, there's some that come up all the time Mr. Peanut people ask about the Morton Salt girl um, but she's sort of too abstract of a drawing, I think, for you to feel like there's a kind of a personality in there. So, yeah, I ruled I ruled people out for that reason and animals too. But you know, there are no shortage of these things. Like they just keep popping up. I added 22 new people to the piece that's up in New York right now. I I update it every time. I show it with people from the location where the piece is being shown. So I hadn't shown it in New York since the first time I ever showed it in 2005 and therefore it was due for a really big New York update. <laughs> there were a lot of new New York, you know, products on shelves with people's faces on them. Thank you. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Hovi. Um, next, we are gonna go over to uh, our friend and regular GE Schwartz. GE, you can turn your mic on now. Thank you, and thank you for this wonderful afternoon. I can't help thinking all through the afternoon of there's a of a maritime lore of successful salvage is mm -hmm. one where at least some of the ship cargo is saved. Otherwise, there's this principle in play of no cure, no payment. Um, that the salver would uh, would basically get nothing, and it seems as though through all across your work, there seems to be this this wonderful sort of metaphor of that, of salvage mm -hmm. and finding things and reclaiming. And of course, and of course, repair and everything. Is that something you-, you I love that about? observation. Yeah, no, thank you. I think really it is like, it would not be inappropriate to say that I'm, I'm trying to look for the flotsam and the jetsam <laughs> of what's kind of around us all the time. Right. Um, maybe this is a good segue to share something sort of funny with you that has happened this past year, but speaking of flotsam and jetsam, I started saving. Um, well, I'll back up to say that, you know, during the early part of the pandemic, like back in sort of March, April, 2020, um, I guess a lot of artists maybe got this question, but this kind of like, wow, the pandemic must be really great for artists. Like you must, it just must be great for you. And you know, you all this time and it's like, no, it sucks. It sucks so badly for everybody. It's terrible people are dying it's not like oh now i'm gonna have a creative renaissance like great it, it was it was sort of absurd and a little offensive to be asked that and and um and i found myself really like anxious really anxious a lot of the time and not sure what to do i wasn't sure what it was appropriate to do i wasn't I, it just you remember all of you what that felt like back then we just didn't know what was going on except that it was awful um so this question about art making, I felt was sort of, um, I just decided to basically chop the word in half and not worry about the art part. <laughs> and just to make things that felt good to make, I just wanted to get my hands on things and construct stuff. It felt very good to me to be, to be sort of busy with the hands and to let the head go wherever it was gonna go. And, um, and one of the things I did, the first sort of thing, I just wanted to make it, so I made it, was a very big, <laughs> If you can see this, um, maybe I have to walk over to show you um, a very large cardboard cactus that um, I built out of Amazon boxes and cast off stuff from the dumpster here. And um, there are about 600 toothpicks glued to the thing that I chopped up and painted. And then I made a sort of cardboard pot for it. And, um, you know, I just made it to have in the house. It was it was really fun to make this. Um, it happened to lead to an assignment for, for the um, undergrad class I taught on humor and visual art last fall. Um, but then recently I made another one. And this one is, uh, the newest one, is made of all of the toilet paper tubes I began hoarding um, during the pandemic because I didn't know really what I was gonna do with them, but they seemed like they could become another kind of plant. Um, and the blooms here are made of, um, Wait, I gotta show you one that, okay, yeah, here. This is a ping pong ball wrapped in crepe paper. And then you can see there are like pins 
stuck into felt. So I'm sort of making all these paper plants and um, it seems they may be part of an exhibition that I guess I'm not at liberty yet to say <laughs> where and when it will be, but it's going to be a show that looks a bit at these older projects that engage this kind of human natural world relationship. And um, these two are things that are sort of an artificial thing meeting another kind of quasi natural thing. So yeah, flotsam and jetsam. I mean, now I'm just going through the trash, our own trash all the time thinking like, could this be plant, ma plant making material? I, I made a little plant pot today out of a plastic yogurt tub that was really like exactly the right shape. So um, that's what I'm up to at the moment. It's a happy, happy moment in the studio, just trying to invent flora. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, GE. Thank you, Nina. Um, there may be a connection to a, a crochet cactus garden with the next oh, yes. question. Um, I'm going to pass the mic over to Margaret. Margaret. Hi, Margaret. You can turn on your mic now. Hi, Nina. <laughs> I love your um, paper plants. Before Christine and I made a crochet coral reef, our very first work in that dimension was a crochet cactus garden. Mm, I don't think weird. I've ever seen that. You have oh, to it, was it was beautiful. It was only little, but it was beautiful. We, we think about oh. resurrecting it. Oh, um, wow. But my question for you is, uh, I've just come back from Finland and I'm obsessed with moomins. And your, <laughs> your work, for everyone who doesn't know, moomins are these little creatures that in, in, a, child, in a children's storybook from the 60s in Finland. And your work reminds me a lot of great children's mm. literature. Mm. It's kind of like Alice in Wonderland and Dr. Seuss and the mm. Moomins. It's a kind of fantastical blend of real worldness and surreal storytelling. And I wondered if you think of your work in the context of children's literature. I mean, it's, it's a very on the mark observation. And, you know, it's also, just as an FYI, it's funny because I grew up reading Tulvi Jansson, the, the author of the Moomin books, um, and she spent time on an island mm. um, very near the part of the archipelago where I, I've grown up spending all of my childhood summers and, you know, the place where sort of my mother's family for many generations has, has had a little, you know, summer place. And where I'm headed happily again this summer because we, nobody could go last year. Um, so this is the place where like I've made a lot of the work, you, I mean, some of the work you saw today, mended spider webs or the mushroom, mended repaired mushroom. Um, many of these things were made in the sort of spirit of, you know, playing on the forest floor, which is what I did as a kid there. And, and with grandparents who were sort of always encouraging a kind of close observation of nature and, you know, know the names of these flowers and these plants and these birds. And um, my grandfather used to keep these crazy charts of every bird that nested in every birdhouse on the property year after year after year. And I've sort of taken it upon me now to be the one who goes and empties out the birdhouses at the end of every season, because um, that means the new birds come and they have a clean place to build their new nest. So, you know, there's a lot of this kind of inherited stuff, I think, from you could say maybe sort of some aspects of Finnish culture in general, certain aspects of it that were sort of passed along to me by my grandparents, um, by my mom too. Um, and, and then, yeah, like, I mean, children's books that I, I think, um, I can think of other authors too, Finnish or Swedish authors, where a lot of it is about a kind of very close looking at um, miniaturized world of the forest or of the forest floor. Um, and not accidentally, this piece that we keep sort of pointing to and not talking about is a film I made called The Recarcassing Ceremony. And again, a very long story short, but it has to do with a game that my brother and I played involving 50 small Playmobil characters. And this game was played very, very obsessively over, over about four years of our childhood summers in Finland. And um, when a tragedy befalls one of the character, two of the characters in the game, which involves actually a shipwreck, <laughs> they were swept out to sea. Um, we have to invent a way to bring them back, and we invent what is called a recarcassing ceremony and um, resurrect them. We take the souls of the departed two and we put them into new blank bodies. So, 
you know, I don't know, children's literature, but maybe just children also have a way of sort of being like, well, why not? You know, why can't one do this? There's a sort of, I think, really interesting pushback on um, reality <laughs> a lot of times, which um, I think back to maybe Thursday, your, your whole beginning opening set of thoughts about wonder, but um, I often talk about the kind of wonder that I find when I'm extremely confused about something. There's a kind of moment of like, I do not know what is going on right now, where like there's a very free kind of open space that happens in my head for a second, where like all things could be possible for some split second until sense, you know, comes back and makes everything go back down with gravity to earth. Um, but I try to sort of, um, in some ways, stay in a state of that sort of suspended, like, what, what else could this be? What is this? But what else could it be? Like, those, I think, are very useful moments. And I think for an artist of, of any stripe, like, we do a lot of interestingly reckless thinking in those moments where we're trying to find our way back to sense. So I just try to pay attention to that. And sometimes there will be the seed of an idea, maybe, and in, in stuff that happens in that moment. That's so beautiful and so lovely that it came back right to the to the Descartes quote. So <laughs> we planned that. That was no, planned. We didn't. Thank you, thank you, <laughs> Margaret, for being in on that plan. Um, I think we have time just for for one more question. Um, I am going to pass the mic over to Frankie. Frankie, you should be able to turn on your mic now. Hi there, um, hi Nina. Hi, hey. I, my name is Frankie. Um, I am a student over here at SUNY Purchase. Um, and I've kind of studied your work a lot this past year. I'm new to being an artist. Mm -hmm. I'm mostly an actor. It's a generational thing in my family, um, but I'm studying new media and I'm really just in awe of a lot of your sound work and your process. Um, but I wanted to ask because I'm still finding my process and finding my style. And I was just curious if you have any uh, words of encouragement or advice mm. to give to any other students who are uh, in this in this call. Yeah, well, thanks first of all. <laughs> I, I was I always want to be like, what have you been studying? Which things? Um, <laughs> St uh, seat assignment. <laughs> oh, okay, 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 yes, cool. Yes. Um, um, okay. Then, well, you know, I'll I'll offer you this. I was very very um, new to making art when I arrived in graduate school. I had not been doing it for that long in college and had sort of barely taken any contemporary art history. Like it's really amusing to think about the things I did not know when I started graduate school. And just back to an earlier thing that came up today. I had no idea who Duchamp was when I got to graduate school. I remember once like asking like, who is that? And people were like, what? You don't? So I, I, I learned a lot um, in a couple of years of steep learning curve and learned a lot from the other students around me. But there was also a sort of great tentativeness with which I approached most things. Like there was a lot of sort of talking myself out of stuff. Um, you know, I think I want to do this, but then that won't work because then this and this. And I remember once in meeting with my um, advisor, um, I, I worked initially when I got to UC San Diego with Helen and Newton Harrison and Helen Harrison saying like, why do you keep talking yourself out of things before you even started them? And, and it was sort of like, gosh, she's right. I mean, I'm already telling you all the reasons why the project isn't good. And I haven't even like attempted the project yet. So, so it took years to sort of really, um, I think you learn it by just making work to sometimes just be okay with not knowing exactly what you're doing for a while. Like I sometimes say this to my own students now, but you have to sometimes just do it to figure out why you're doing it. And you know, that has been true for me my entire career. There are things I'm doing right now, like maybe these paper plants, I don't entirely understand them yet. Um, but I'm sort of more okay with not having the answer for a while. Um, I do feel like artists kind of have the responsibility of, of be, they, I, I do think I, I will sort of put this out there as a should, like they should be able to speak to what they do and to offer some, some considered reasons for why a thing happened and the way that it happened. And, um, you know, I personally would rather have the words for that than to leave that entirely up to other people to have the words for. So that's just maybe where I land on that question. But I think 
I think, um, you know, just you have to sort of make a few leaps of faith and just follow the thing enough that you can kind of get the roots and it can get the roots in the ground. And um, sometimes the key to helping that happen for me is just not telling anyone about it for a while until it's underway. And then no one is going to say something where you're like, oh shit, it wasn't, it's not good. They didn't react the way I wanted, or I didn't get a compliment or whatever it is. So, um, so I think you have to kind of just be a little bit private and uh, protective when appropriate. That's kind of hard in school because everyone's always going, what does it mean? What is it? <laughs> what are you doing? Um, but, you know, keep some secrets, I'd say. Yeah. Thank and you. And good luck. I love Purchase. I think that's such a great program. I, I haven't visited for years, but I've always had great visits up there. So you're in a good place. Well, thank you, Frankie, for that question. Um, once again, thank you, Nina and Thurza, for such a brilliant and beautiful Friday. Um, as is our real tradition, though, we end our events with poetry. And today I have the pleasure of welcoming our lunchtime poet laureate, Fargo Nassim Tabaki. Uh, Fargo is a queer Palestinian American performance artist, and his writings can be found in Strange Horizons, Apex Magazine, The Shallow Ends, Misna, Peach Mag, and elsewhere. His performance works have been programmed at Outsider Fest, Intersection Solo Fest, and the National Queer Arts Festival, and are supported by the Arizona Commission on the Arts. Uh, Fargo will also be a featured guest in our upcoming 41st Radical Poetry Reading, curated by Kyle Carrero Lopez on June 16th. So consider today as a bit of a sneak peek, but uh, without further ado, Fargo, I'm going to pass the mic over to you. of after Milton, for and with George. My last obedience to the restraints of the language of bone breakers, to the tyranny inside the gloved hand, inside of, I dissolve it now. I offer it to you slaughtered like a purveyor of tear gas, gutted like a sustainer of museums. I beg you now, who from the last will be present, anchoring my every tooth planted in a garden fertilized by the ashes of Colombia, rend my body, bring life to Arabs, bring water to wash my body of blood. I will be wrath of of, song of, blade and flame of, tooth and nail of, I will entomb the remnants of a board of directors inside my own heart, your hands forgiving the debts of rule, translating the missives of scorpions, the homilies of molotovs, breathing the desiccations of security cameras, you crater of tongue, you loveliness in retribution, tributary of unpriced goods, of fire and ice, of a program to liberate, of the drowning of conquerors, of an endless intifada, you singer of a stone to the skull of a soldier. Here, I beg you with libations of tanks, with offerings of hair, of loss, of the suit of a banker, of boots pried from the feet which carried a corpse to its nest at Colombia. I give you my fears and my hesitancies to cast into the depths to unlanguage, I beg you, lower me, my heart, the hewn signature of a stonemason. Bring me low, unmake me roughly, silica dust outlining my shape like an angel, silent in the poisoned air. Steady my rifle aimed toward the killing of tree planters, the writing of sins, the breathing of earth, the dreaming of children, of this, of more, sing. Empty the earth of song to pour into my ventricled weapon. What is low in me make sharp. What is hurt in me make sharper. You made with earth and a million stomping feet and what is light in me and what in me is light. Hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for a really wonderful conversation that I was glad to listen into. Um, uh, these poems and all of my work emerge as uh, gestures towards spiritual liberation and survival for my people in the face of a settler colonial genocide, which is ongoing as we speak every day uh, 
regardless of ceasefires or peace talks. Um, wherever you are and however you can, find a way to organize in your personal and professional life uh, towards joining the uh, call of the Palestinian Civil Society for Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions. Um, there are a number of draconian anti-BDS laws in 35 states. If you live in one of those states, uh, I would suggest visiting Palestine Legal for resources on how to combat those laws and work around them. Uh, so I'll read uh, two more poems. For Sami Abu Diak and every prisoner. The first time I weep for you, my skin splits here and here, these two bumps of flesh birthing new bone. I had never considered antlers, though immolation crossed my mind. Blood rivers down from my mortar tube wounds and paints me totris patterned. Each time I weep again for you, my antlers grow longer and sprout new comrades. Within a day, they have reached the ocean, while I continue to weep until my forehead longs to split again. Squid trace my antlers with their tentacles. They are looking for the way home. Moving along with my antlers, the squid interrupt a Coast Guard ship, patrolling the blurred end of international waters, wrap themselves around the enforcers and begin to squeeze. I cannot see remaining as I am in my easy chair, but my antlers tell me that the deaths were painful. Meantime, my antlers have reached the Mediterranean. Today, it is dry. Along its floor, long repressed creatures skulk, scowling at their first sun. When the scientists come from the neighboring nations with scopes, the floor creatures make short work of them. I have been weeping and growing my antlers while I have been going about my days, shopping for groceries, selling my last organ to buy groceries, buying into an idea of time that will use me up and use me up and let me waste and every time I see or hear or speak a letter of the alphabet or breathe or instruct my muscles to motion, I weep for you. Every time I weep for you, my antlers grow and grow, each a vein pulsing with the rush of my own blood. They grow back onto the coast and beyond. I am at this point unable to move for the weight of them until finally they stop, though I weep ceaseless until finally it takes only the smallest twitch of my head to jut them upwards into your prison guard's two lungs, depriving it at last the privilege of breath. The prison guard dies and no one motions a muscle to stop it from dying. I stop weeping and cry. My antlers split and enter every keyhole and burst them open like a pomegranate. And all of us weep ourselves antler enough to do the same tomorrow. My weapons, goring a path to die in my father's two arms. Uh, yeah, thank you so much again. I'll, I'll read one more and then be done for today. Palestine is a futurism, prophecies, Cruising Jerusalem. How we make meaning of ourselves and our being as Palestinian when we are no longer beholden to understanding ourselves in the shadows of disaster is not just a passing whim, a theoretical exercise. To ask how and who we are now and who we will be when we are free insists that our future selves are always in sight, that our freedom is always in sight. Sophia Azeb. Miracle makers, we touch heaven with our toes. Heaven looks like us. We build our own futures. We build them to look like us. No soft power over us. Radically, we define what it means to be us. Our slingshots are a collectivism. Our fishnets are a Nostradamus. Return is a future, is a past. Past is a future we return to. Sunspot tasters, we rhizome. Science resistors, we hex the world. Only the end of the world for us. Only the biggest us we can build. In the land of no states, I will lick your eyeballs. In the sleep of no documents, I will kiss your iris. 
The soil retains its ideologies. The soil turns them into batatas. City wall, lean against. I stroke your stubble. Tunnel walkers, we dissolve any military. An undeclared end to all declarations. The sun has set on the British Empire, on the American Empire, on the empire of Goldman Sachs, on the empire of military contractors, on the empire of eviction enforcers, on the empire of hunger consultants, on the empire of securitization, on the empire of possibility eaters. Inside a poem, we found a tunnel. Inside the tunnel, we found ourselves. We liked our taste, we tasted our collectivism. We remembered the land was already a Marxism. We remembered our names and the art of making new ones. Lay down your arms and I will lay with them. Make me the strings of a gutted piano. I will writhe and make the song of our only nation. Return is an ontological dance step. The birds are teaching us to stay. Future is a dirty batata. Every day, we are saying no to the things that keep us apart. Every day, we are saying no to enclosure. Every day, we are cruising Jerusalem. Every day, Jerusalem is cruising us back. Palestine is a futurism. Futurism is an expansiveness of understanding. Futurism is a demolition of monuments. Futurism, a rioting cactus. Palestine, a relation of loveliness. Futurism is a Palestine. Palestine is a system of care. Care is a futurism of hands. Futurism is a Palestine. Palestine is already here. Palestine is already everywhere. <laughs> much, much applause. Um, thank you, Fargo, so much for that powerful performance and for sharing your words with us today. Um, I do want to note, as, as mentioned in the chat, there are some links to Palestine Legal and to a few other resources, if you will please have a look at that, check it out. Um, thank you once again, Thurza, Nina, today's event has been wonderful. I couldn't think of a better way to spend a Friday. Um, I wanna thank everyone for joining and also let you all know, we do this every day at 1 p.m. So if you're available, join us on Monday for a conversation on Curating in the Blockchain Landscape with curators Christiana Ina Kimbe Boyle, Annika Meyer, and Kalani Nicole, led by rail editor at large Charlotte Kent. And we'll conclude with a poetry reading by Albert Mobilio. Uh, you can now turn on your mics, everyone, to say hello, goodbye, good weekend, and uh, stay safe and well, everyone. Uh -huh. kind of, yeah. So Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Thank you, Nina. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much, Thank everyone. You Shout out to Purchase. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Nina. You Shout out to the rail. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Nick. I have another client. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank that but that that gorgeous thing. I mean, it's like it sells it so gorgeous. Hey, <laughs> fine. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a great great weekend, and we'll see you later. Likewise, likewise, one. Take care. Ciao, everyone. <laughs>